Classical Lady 9 KBYU FM presents The Christmas Chronicles, an exclusive dramatic reading by Tim Slover. This eight part series captures the magic and mystery of everyone's favorite Yuletide character, revealing a true and complete history of Santa Claus. In episode four, Klaus by magic learned to communicate with the eight flying reindeer. But after a glorious Christmas Eve delivery, Klaus returned to his beloved wife, Anna, and found her lifeless. Episode 5, The Green Council Convenes, performed by Richard Johnstone. Klaus was dreaming. In his dream, he was racing in a sleigh drawn by eight reindeer up a steep road of ice that ran into the sky. It was dawn. Up ahead, as the sun rose, he could see a wintry country in the clouds. It had parklands and mountains and a waterfall spilling through a hole in a frozen lake. And in the midst of the country was a magnificent castle of green and silver and pearl. I'm going home, he thought in his dream. Home to Anna. But that thought brought Klaus's dream to a terrible and abrupt end. He woke up and remembered everything, speaking to Dasher and Dasher answering because of the Christmas magic Klaus himself had unleashed, the thrill of rushing through the frosty air with the eight flyers and delivering all those toys in record time, but especially the shock of coming home to find his wife lying pale and still in their bed. But that must have been hours ago now. Anna, he called out in anguish before he even opened his eyes. A familiar hand took his, and a familiar voice said, Yes, dear Klaus, I'm here. Merry Christmas. He opened his eyes, and there she was, Anna. As real and warm and alive as ever. Klaus sat bolt upright in bed, for that was where he was, and hugged her tight. Then he held her at arm's length and looked at her in wonder. Aren't you dead, Anna? he asked. Not any more, she said. It's best I not be, apparently. Klaus looked as confused at this as you or I would have. Oh, I was dead. Killed by Rolf Eckhoff's herbs, which I was fool enough to put into my broth. Last night, out on the mountain, I felt something, Klaus said. Something cold coming up from down here in the valley. I think that must have been the hate and spite of poor Rolf Eckhoff. Poor Rolf Eckhoff, Klaus growled. When I find him, I'll stuff his herbs down his throat. Well, that's how I felt, too, at first, said Anna thoughtfully. I wanted to tear him limb from limb after I died, or at least haunt him. But then they talked to me, and, well, I don't feel that way now. Klaus sprang from his bed. Where is he? he roared. His hard carpenter's hands were in fists, and his gentle face was twisted with rage. Where is he? Calm down, Klaus, Anna said mildly. We don't have to worry about any of that. Isn't it lucky? And when she smiled dazzlingly at him, the last vestige of the only real anger he had ever felt in his life promptly deserted him. Anyway, they decided it was better to bring me back than take you over, Anna said. So I'm alive again, good as new. They? Klaus asked. The ones who brought me back. The ones who laid you on our bed after you swooned. She took his hand and smiled, which was very sweet of you to do. But who are they? Klaus asked. Anna took his arm and led him through the bedroom door. It's time you met them. Klaus was never sure later how to describe what greeted his eyes next. The rest of his and Anna's house was mostly one all-purpose room, where they cooked and worked and drew chairs up to the fireplace. But at first he could find no trace of that room. Where was the cook stove? Where were the table and chairs? Where the familiar hearth? Ah. There they were. He could just make them out scattered around the edges of a new room, which had displaced the old one. Right in the centre of this new room was a beautiful round table. 
Klaus could not help but admire its workmanship, surrounded by six chairs so tall and carved that they looked like thrones. Four of the chairs were occupied. The amazing thing to Klaus was that the new room was at least three times larger than his and Anna's living room. So for that Christmas day, Klaus reported later, our house was bigger inside than it was outside. We, we sent the priest home, said one of the people sitting at the table. He was a tall man with a kindly expression, and like the other three sitting with him, he glowed faintly. Uh, he will not remember that we were here. Uh, he'll recall only that he did something quite stupendously heroic to save Anna's life. He grinned affectionately. No doubt he will make a sermon of it, taking full credit. Uh, sit down, Klaus, sit down. Uh, yes, these thrones are meant for you and Anna. So Klaus and Anna sat shyly at the table and looked around at the others at the table. Never had they been in such company. Uh, I'm your namesake, Klaus, said the man with the kindly face. In my country, a thousand years ago, I was called Nicolaos, or, as you would say, uh, Nicholas. Uh, Saint Nicholas, said one of the other men at the table, raising his finger. He was the colour of burnished black walnut wood. Uh, this is Saint Babucar, Nicholas said. Uh, he was one of the wise astrologers who sought and found the holy infant. Babucar stood and bowed to Klaus. Here they call me Balthazar. They've never been to Africa, so I do not blame them. And I am Abigail, said a quiet woman sitting on the other side of Nicholas. You will have heard of her, Babukar said, for she it was when that son of a jackal... Uh, Babukar, cried Nicholas. Oh, sorry, said Babukar. He rose and bowed again. I meant to say when that innkeeper would not give a room to the Holy Family, uh, St. Abigail led them to the stable. Anna looked at her. And Abigail turned and held her gaze for a moment. She radiated a compassion and empathy so intense that Anna felt a strong desire to tell her about the one sorrow which burned her heart. But no, thought Anna, that is not why they have come. And this is Saint Farouk, Nicholas said, of a handsome man with jet black hair and a neatly clipped beard. Uh, he was a herder of sheep, the first to leave his flock and hasten to the stable when he heard the glad tidings. Farouk rose, touched his fingers to his forehead and his breast, and then bowed with an elegant flourish. The blessings of all creation be upon you, he said. Uh, now, Klaus, Nicholas said, uh, like you, I know something about slipping gifts into houses late at night, and so I'm head of this commission. We're called the Green Council, uh, named for all that stays alive in the winter. And we others, said Abigail, were drawn into the council because of our devotion to the child whose winter feast you honour with your toy deliveries. You know about those? Klaus asked in some surprise. Oh, heaven knows of them, said Abigail. That is why we are here, Nicholas said. You see, last night you unleashed the magic of Christmas. I watch the skies always, said Babakar excitedly, uh, and I can tell you that the stars were aligned perfectly for the event. Did you not see them, Klaus, especially your birth star of Jupiter? Dasher had waited so long for you to speak to him, said Farouk. Animals always know far more than we think. When you spoke to Dasher, and he replied, we could no longer be kept away. And, and that proved well for your wife, concluded Nicholas. Klaus reached over and squeezed Anna's hand. I thank you a thousand times, he said, for bringing her back to me. 
This Ekhoff is the son of a desert hyena, cried Babukar. He banged the table with his fist. But why must you always insult the animal creation? asked Farouk indignantly. Babukar rose and bowed again. I meant no offence, he said, and sat down again. Nicholas turned to Klaus. It is your work that we have come about, he said. We are here to help you. That is... And he and the other three saints around the table turned intently toward Klaus. That is, if you choose to continue it. What do you mean? asked Klaus, puzzled. Well, you have a choice, of course, Nicholas said. If you did not, what you do would have no value. So, uh, do you choose to continue making your Christmas deliveries? Klaus thought of how weary he had been last night, how old and spent before the eight flyers had come. He felt it all again now, only more so in the presence of these vibrant, shining saints. A great longing suddenly grew up in him to rest, to sell his tools and move with Anna into the retirement house next door and spend his days holding her hand in the sun. He had done enough, hadn't he? What child in the Black Forest had cause to complain of his service? No one tried to rush Klaus in his decision. No one tried to convince him one way or the other, but the whole room seemed to hold its breath. I'm tired, Klaus said at last. Even though they were saints, the others at the table couldn't quite hide their disappointment. Ah, said St. Nicholas. I see, said St. Farouk. Well, it's understandable, said St. Babukar. St. Abigail just waited, smiling a small, knowing smile. So, I'm going to sleep for a week before I start on next year's toys, Klaus said. He looked at the relieved faces all around the table. You didn't really think I would quit, did you? The room breathed again. Klaus will continue his work, Nicholas intoned solemnly, just as though he was proclaiming Klaus's decision for some official record. Babukar slapped Klaus heartily on the back. I knew you would make the right choice. All creation rejoices, Farouk said happily, the eagle on his crag and leviathan in the deep, the leopard as he paces the forest and the camel as he... Oh, camels never rejoice, interrupted Babukar. This I know from my own experience. Well, perhaps you are not good to your camels, you and the other kings, said Farouk indignantly. Perhaps you are not so wise when it comes to care of humps and feet. Babukar was about to reply. But Klaus intervened hastily. Uh, if the Green Council is really serious about helping, he said, more villagers are added to my list each year. Even with flying reindeer, it's a large job. I could use some assistance with my deliveries. St. Farouk looked pale. I'm uncomfortable with heights, he said. My back is not what it was, Babukar noted. We have other help to give. St. Nicholas protested with a chuckle. There are certain gifts, and because you have chosen to continue your work, we may now bestow them. And the first gift is, you are both to tarry. As are the reindeer, said Farouk excitedly, as representatives of the animal creation. None of you is to grow an hour older, and death will never find you so long as your task lasts said Nicholas. It's a great honour, tarrying. But you will not do it here. Your work will continue elsewhere. And then, of course, uh, you're both to be made saints, said Babukar, like us. And the reindeer, said Farouk enthusiastically. Nicholas gave Farouk a hard look. Uh, no, uh, not the reindeer. Animals, no matter how admirable, are not to be made saints. Oh, what about the Lamb of God? replied Farouk. It's a metaphor, Babukar said. Everyone knows that. I'm not so sure, Farouk said. Speaking as a shepherd, I can definitely say that sheep rank at the very pinnacle of creation. Well, sheep, Babukar protested, they're dumber than camels. Uh, but, asked Anna, in some discomfort, 
Don't people pray to saints? I don't think I'd like that. Um, oh, that's nothing to worry about, Nicholas said. All prayers really go to God. You won't even hear them. Klaus will. They all turned to see Abigail standing with shining eyes that seemed to see beyond the walls of the big room within the small room. One day, from all the world, he will hear the petitions of children. Then she turned and looked at Anna. You have longed for children, dear heart, Anna gasped. How did she know? So, Abigail continued, all the children in the world, everywhere and forever, now belong to you and Klaus. You are Mother and Father Christmas. And Anna's sorrow rose up and turned into joy and filled her soul. Neither she nor Klaus comprehended the size of the world and the number of children in it. But from that hour, Anna's thoughts and feelings were ever turned toward them. St. Nicholas produced a large, very thick roll of papers and thumped it onto the table. Uh, now, he said, we have many plans to deliberate before we bestow our gifts. Babukar yawned extravagantly. Enough, he said. The stars come out soon. I must watch them. Always you think of your stars, Farouk grumbled. Why do you not regard creation here on earth? You take sheep, for instance. I will not take sheep, roared Babukar. Keep your sheep to yourself. I want nothing to do with them. Uh, gentlemen, said Nicholas, we have important matters to discuss. He started to unroll his papers again. Uh, Klaus, uh, Anna, Abigail put a hand gently on Nicholas's arm. Do you not think that their hearts will tell them all they really need to know? Uh, yes, Babukar said, again holding up one of his ebony fingers. This will make their lives interesting instead of boring. Nicholas thought for a moment. Yes, he said slowly. I see that you're right. Then he used his intoning voice again. So be it. Klaus and Anna will not be told. They will discover their new lives moment by moment. We may now bestow our gifts. Anna went outside and whistled for Dasher, and he came trotting up with his brothers and sister. When the reindeer entered the room, it expanded even larger to accommodate the bigger crowd. They showed not the least glimmer of surprise at this, nor at being in the presence of saints, nor, when it was explained to them, what was about to happen. This is what we were born for, Dasher said simply. You see, said St. Farouk, animals always know, and remember, reindeer are closely related to sheep, very closely. Are you certain, Nicholas, that we cannot make them saints as well? Nicholas assured Farouk that tarrying would be honour enough and Babukar questioned the consanguinity of sheep to reindeer, and Farouk launched into a learned discourse on creation, its orders and families. But eventually the table and all but two of the thrones were moved aside. Anna and Klaus sat on the remaining thrones, side by side, holding hands in the middle of the room. The reindeer stood close all around them. Then Nicholas cleared his throat and announced, "'Because Klaus has chosen freely to continue his work, it is given to us to bestow on you all the gift of tarrying. And so I say to all of you, tarry. And Klaus and Anna, you are now saints, Saint Anna and Saint Klaus. A ripple of influence went out from Nicholas and from the other saints, and with it the delicious scent of peppermint, which is the odour of Christmas magic. The ripple passed into those in the centre of the circle like an effervescence which stirred their blood and made them feel so awake that they wondered if they had spent their former lives half asleep. Anna and Klaus sprang to their feet. And then the ripple rebounded back from them, past the saints, out of the house and into the village. 
all the men in the retirement house next door sniffed that peppermint scent and abruptly felt like getting out their tools and starting a project. Farmers suddenly found they could hardly wait to start their spring planting, and mothers took needle and thread and darned a hundred pairs of socks. Even a fussy baby in the house farthest away in the village stopped crying and said its first words, Santa Claus. But the ripple, so energizing to most, had a far different effect on one man, Rolf Eckhoff who had fled after giving Anna poisoned herbs, could not stay away for long. Some men must see the effect of their evil deed to be satisfied, and Rolf Eckhoff was of this kind. So he had crept back to Klaus and Anna's house and loitered in the shadows to see if his revenge against Klaus, so long planned, had taken effect. Was the woman dead or not? It was the only Christmas gift he wanted and he was sick with the desire for it. He had to know. Rolf Eckhoff was in the very act of trying to squeeze through the bedroom window when the ripple struck him. And because he was so ravaged by malice and deceit, and now murder, it destroyed his body entirely. Not a particle of it was ever found and it flung his poor, shredded, immortal soul to the four winds. It was long, long years before he was able to reassemble that dark spirit and make more trouble for Klaus. But of course he did, and the trouble he caused was so demonic, for that is what he was now, a demon, that it may yet engulf us all. But knowing nothing of any of this, Anna and Klaus looked at each other and saw that they were changed. Their hair and Klaus's beard were now snow white. Yet looking into Anna's eyes, Klaus could see that down in her soul she was young and wild as springtime, and somehow deeper and more truly Anna than ever before in her life. Anna, meanwhile, took one look at the reindeer and knew exactly what was about to happen. Cover your ears, she shouted, and they all did, just in time, because Dasher and his brothers and sister lifted up their heads and opened their throats and bugled so loud that the rafters actually shook. Anna suddenly wondered why she had not gone racing with Dasher for so many years. And Klaus bet any man or beast in the room that he could run to the top of Mount Fellburg without stopping. Nobody took his bet. Then Klaus gathered his woodworking tools and his crimson coat and breeches, and Anna her fabrics and sewing things and loaded them all into the sleigh. They were the only things they wanted to take with them from their old life. Uh, take your cook stove, Anna. St. Nicholas advised. Uh, of all your fine cookery, my dear, which dish is your favourite? My maple sugar cookies, she said automatically, naturally. Here, here, agreed Klaus. Very well, then, said Nicholas. Uh, from this day forward, Klaus, all cookies will do you good, but specially Anna's maple sugar cookies. They will renew you, body and spirit. Please eat a lot of them. If you do, you will find yourself growing ever stronger as the years roll by. And so they loaded the cook stove onto the sleigh with the other things. Klaus wrote a brief letter to the retired guild members next door, bequeathing to them his and Anna's house. Before he sealed it, he included in the letter the key to the house and some recipes Anna knew the retired members particularly liked. Then, with Dasha's help, he let the package down the chimney of the retirement home. We've been happy in this house you built for Dasher, Anna said to Klaus, as arm in arm they gazed at it. They both cried a little to honor their house, and then they left. Led by Nicholas, the eight flyers pulled their sleigh deep into the loneliest part of the Black Forest. There, waiting for them, was a broad, shining ice road. 
its entrance marked on either side by two variegated holly bushes in silver pots, each engraved with a star and a reindeer rampant. It ran steeply up until it disappeared into the clouds. The magic scent of peppermint was in the air. Here is your first discovery, Klaus, Nicholas told him. This is the straight road. This world and all its roads are curved, Babukar explained. Only this road is straight and can lead you to your new home. And so it is. In that far-off year of Klaus's transformation and for many years afterwards, the straight road was fixed permanently to the earth in that remote region of the Black Forest. Alas for our days when it can no longer be so. The Green Council bid Klaus and the others farewell. We will come if you need us, Abigail said. But don't call frivolously, Babukar said. I'll be very busy watching the stars. Then the eight flyers bounded up the precipitous expanse of the straight road. Ho, ho, ho! Klaus laughed because of the sheer fun and adventure of it all. They galloped up through the clouds and on and on until they left the circles of this world and came to the true north. Long time that country had been preparing for them, and now it was finished. Merry were its flowery meadows in the budding springtime, cool and bracing its waterfall and lake in high summer, and majestic its dark and spicy pine forests in deep winter. But most beautiful, at all times of year, was Castle Noel, with its towers and halls all green and silver and pearl. When Klaus first saw it, he knew it was his dream come to real life. And when he and Anna drove at last through the great crystal gates into the courtyard of that castle and came to a stop, they made their second discovery. A throng of people, hundreds of them, were silently waiting for them there. Anna, a little frightened, leaned over to Klaus and whispered in his ear, Who are they all? Then one of the people stepped forward to speak. You have heard Episode 5, The Green Council Convenes, performed by Richard Johnstone. Next time here, Of Space and Time. The Christmas Chronicles is an eight-part dramatic reading from Classical 89, written by Tim Slover. Music is by Robert Roberry. The series producer is Judith O. Lawson-Turney, and technical producer is Jackie Tataishi. Promotion by Christine Knockleby. The executive producer is Walter Rudolph. To acquire a CD copy of The Christmas Chronicles as you've heard it, and for more information about The Christmas Chronicles, visit classical89.org. The Christmas Chronicles is produced by Classical 89, KBYU-FM, Provo, Utah, in cooperation with the BYU Division of Continuing Education.